as well. And so I'll call the meeting to order. And if you would rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the United United of the United States of America and to the and republic, to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, stand, one nation, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice for all. For all. Thank you. <laughs> so, Dee, if you could call the roll. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Stewart? Present. Director Yi? Present. Director Epen? Present. Director Wallace? Present. Great. Well, welcome to the January 13th, 2021 regular meeting of the Washington Township Healthcare District Board of Directors. To comply with Alameda County's order number 20-21 as issued on December 7, 2020 to comply with social distancing measures and other restrictions necessary to control the spread of COVID-19, this meeting will be conducted by Zoom. I ask that you please mute your system until such time as you need to speak. Governor Newsom's executive order N-2920 explicitly waives the Brown Act provision that requires the physical presence of members, the clerk, or of the public as a condition of participation in or quorum for a public meeting. We continue to comply with the Brown Act in providing dial-in information in order to provide the public the opportunity to attend the meeting. <laughs> public notice for this meeting, including dial-in information, has been posted appropriately on our website. We are recording tonight's regular session of the board meeting. It will be posted on our website for future viewing. Members of the public are invited to speak during oral communications. When prompted, please state your name for the record, then proceed with your statement not to exceed three minutes on issues or concerns not on the agenda and within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the board. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak at this meeting? Hearing none, D, are there any written communications? There are none. Very good. We will now move on to our consent calendar. Our consent calendar consists of those agenda items that the board will approve with one motion, unless either a member of the board or a member of the public requests to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar. If any items are removed from the consent calendar, the board will take action on the removed agenda item later in the meeting under the action item heading of the agenda. Does anyone on the board want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, does any member of the public want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar items A through C? Mr. President, in accordance with district law, policies and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors approve the consent calendar items A through C. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Director Wallace. D, if you could call the roll. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Yee. Aye. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Thank you. The consent calendar uh, has passed and uh, we now have presentations uh, or a one presentation on COVID-19 vaccination safety. Okay. Uh, Kimberly, if you could introduce our speaker. Okay, bye. Yes, uh, we have three speakers this evening and um, I think all three are, are known to the board, but I'll give a short introduction. Uh, we have Dr. Jeffrey Stewart. He, he currently serves as Chief Medical Officer for uh, Washington Hospital, where he's been a member of the medical staff since 1994. Prior to this role, Dr. Stewart, an anesthesiologist, was the Medical Director of Washington Outpatient Surgery Center for 14 years. Dr. Stewart also serves as a surveyor for AAAHC, the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare. Dr. Stewart received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University, he went to medical school at USC and completed his residency at UCLA. 
Uh, uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Diane Martin. Uh, she has been a member of Washington Hospital's medical staff since 1984 and has served in many uh, leadership roles at Washington Hospital, including the Chair of the Department of Medicine and the Chair of the Clinical Evaluation Committee, which includes uh, pharmacy and therapeutics and infection control. Dr. Martin attended medical school in Charleston, South Carolina, after which she completed her internship and residency at the University of Kentucky School of Medicine. She received a fellowship in infectious disease at the UC Davis, of Med UC Davis School of Medicine. Uh, she serves on the Board of Directors of Life Elder Care, and then she's a member of Washington Township Medical Foundation. Uh, lastly, we uh, know Mary Boron. She's our Chief of Quality and Resource Management. She has been in, with Washington Hospital for 12 years. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from University of San Francisco and worked in med surge and in the emergency department uh, nursing for seven years before transitioning into infection prevention in 2009. She obtained her Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of San Francisco. She is a certified clinical nurse leader and is certified in infection prevention. She completed her doctorate in nursing practice from Samuel Merritt University. So uh, Mary and Dr. Martin and Dr. Stewart, I'll turn it over to the three of you. Okay, Mary, do you want to introduce uh, Dr. Martin? Yes, um, we're going to um, start off with Dr. Martin presenting the slides, and then Dr. Stewart and I will do the last couple ones. So you can go ahead, Dr. Martin. So you can hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little challenge. Uh, so, Mary, are you going to drive the slides for me? Me is going to drive the slides, and then Three, we will. Three is driving them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So, next slide, please. So we wanted to kind of update the board and community in general about why they really, really need the vaccine for COVID and why it's particularly important. Um, obviously, just like influenza, it prevents the spread of disease and particularly at people who are at high risk for severe illness, which represents our immunocompromised patients, over 65 year old patients, comorbidities such as diabetes, obesity, renal failure. So those people are severely affected by COVID. Um, the vaccine can protect your body by creating an antibody response. So when we do the injection from either the RNA, which is the COVID vaccine or this, the inactivated vaccine, which is a virus, which is part of the flu vaccine, then basically you become immune. For a flu, we have a lot of experience for the COVID vaccine, less experience, but it does look like the immunity is quite rapid and quite powerful, even just with a single dose of the Pfizer or the um, current Moderna vaccine. So hopefully this will prevent illness or at least reduce the severity of illness. So if a person does become ill with it, they're less likely to be admitted, less likely to be in an intensive care unit, and less likely to have severe consequences. So hopefully that's the outcome for the COVID vaccine and why we really are trying to get people um, vaccinated as soon as possible and as widely as possible. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, there are several vaccines and clinical trials. The two that have been approved are the Pfizer and Moderna, which is what Washington Hospital has already rolled out to our frontline staff and beginning to widen that um, uh, availability as well. There's still two in clinical trials, probably more than that, but two close ready to be approved in clinical trials. One is the AstraZeneca and the other one is the Johnson & Johnson. And these trials are going to be monitored for quite a long time because both of these are, are except for the Johnson & Johnson, are RNA uh, vaccines, which are made at a very different production rate and a very different response rate. Um, they have been currently FDA approved, but long term, we'll see what that um, will show. So the FDA did emergency authorization for these vaccines with very limited data. So there are only about 40,000 in each of the initial trials. 20,000 20, got the vaccine, 20,000 didn't. Um, and then they were exposed to virus as much as we would be without using our mask and shields. And the infection rate was quite a bit higher in the um, placebo infected um, arm of the trial compared to the oops, 
placebo affected trial compared to the, um, the actual vaccine. So uh, obviously the Moderna and the Pfizer are the ones that are currently in um, uh, commercially available. Uh, next slide. So why are these different? These are mRNA technology. So there are two different type of um, areas for the vaccine. One is the mRNA, which is uh, what we're currently using. And there's also the neutralizing antibodies. So what we see is the mRNA basically goes after the virus and renders it um, harmless. And after the vaccine, the body is beginning to recognize this mRNA and basically it kind of goes and covers the virus so that the, the body will recognize that as being a foreign invader and then begin to make the antibodies against it. Um, so that's the protein, the, the spike protein, which is, if you've seen the pictures, are the little studs that are on the outside of the coat of the virus. Um, Currently, the Pfizer is two doses, three weeks apart. Moderna, two doses, 28 days apart. Pfizer, um, the AstraZeneca will also be two doses, and the Johnson & Johnson's is a single dose. Um, none of these have been approved for children. Um, there have been some evaluation in children, but currently not approved for uh, children. The, the Pfizer is 16 and older, Moderna 18 and older. The other area that has probably not been studied and not approved is in pregnancy. So there are some pregnant women who've been vaccinated and mother and child have done well, but these are usually not included in the FDA approval currently. Next slide. So the biggest question a lot of people say, well, if I get the vaccine, am I going to get the virus? And the answer is no. This is just the protein part of the virus, not the infective part of the virus itself. So what we are hoping is people become immune and then possibly will not get, or if they do get COVID-19, it will be a much lesser infection. It takes several weeks for the immunity to be full, although the studies have shown us within about 10 days, the antibody level to both of these vaccines is extremely high. Again, we just don't know how sustained that's going to be. The vaccine is very safe at this point. There is a contraindication to people who have had anaphylactic responses to other vaccines, such as anaphylactic to influenza or anaphylactic to other products. Um, so that is another contraindication, age, pregnancy, and allergic reaction. Um, when we're giving it at Washington, we're extremely safe. We have a designated area. Most of you have probably been vaccinated. Um, very safe area. So it's monitored by two RNs. We have a mini crash cart and we also have our gurney right there, which thank goodness we have not used and we're one floor above the ER. So this is about as safe as you're ever going to get. So safety issues are ongoing and we still have much to learn. But so far with all the rollout that we've done, I think very, very safe so far. Next slide. So the vaccine does have some side effects and usually these are very limited and in terms of extent and also limited in terms of days that you might expect to have it. So some people get redness and swelling around the shot area. I know I did, but it was only for a couple days, even on the second dose. And they do say sometimes second dose gives people a more severe reaction. And also, unfortunately, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have the severe reaction than people who are older. We do see fever, fatigue, headache, some nausea, some vomiting, muscle pain, chills, joint pain. Right now we are monitoring people who are getting the vaccine uh, for at least 15 minutes after the vaccine to make sure that they are going to not have any immediate reaction. Side effects usually last only a a day or two, max three days. And we've seen some people have a little bit achiness longer than that, but it's extremely rare at this point. Um, if they do have side effects, we encourage them to contact us so we can monitor this. And again, provide feedback to the um, manufacturers and, and the FDA. There is an FDA uh, adverse vaccine website that we report to if it's something that's more than just the 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 ones I listed, it's more severe, then we do definitely report to the FDA website. Next slide. I, we can break off and ask questions in between if you want or wait till the end. So currently the way that the vaccines are being distributed is through coordination with Alameda County and uh, CDC. So we wanna make sure that people 
um, get these. There's a, a, a breakdown that the uh, Alameda County has provided, and that's going to be on one of the subsequent slides. But we are targeting, sorry. Peter gets tired at the end of the day. Um, so we're targeting healthcare personnel right now, our frontline workers, and also those in long-term care facilities, both the providers as well as the patients. Um, the, this is the tier 1A, 1B, 1C that Alameda County is currently including. And that includes the, the 1B would be the 75 and above essential frontline workers, such as first responders, teachers, public transfer, um, fire, uh, police, grocery workers, and then the 1C is the 65 or those middle range who have more severe underlying medical conditions such as diabetes, obesity, renal failure, immunosuppression for some reason, and then all essential workers in the food service and in construction. Currently, we are in phase one of the vaccine and potentially we'll be moving to phase two uh, within the next month. So again, we coordinate with uh, California Public Health and Alameda County uh, to make sure that we are rolling these out appropriately. We also, because of the sub um, freezing temperature that the Pfizer has to be in, we are fortunate enough to have the minus 70 degree freezer um, at our facility available. Uh, the Moderna is a minus uh, 30, which is not as difficult to do. The Johnson & Johnson will probably be at same temperature as the flu shots. These basically have to be uh, thawed before use and the Pfizer is reconstituted. You're getting about five to six doses per vial for that. Uh, the Moderna is individually. Uh, so we are very, uh, strict and in terms of adhering to the regulations and guidelines for storage, reconstitution, um, leaving them out. Uh, I think it can be no more than about four to five hours for the Pfizer and a little bit more like six to seven hours for the Moderna. So we're extremely careful with that, making sure that we're not going to waste any virus, any um, vaccine product because uh, we didn't have people available or was thawed and not used. Uh, next slide. So the questions they ask is if I can have a vaccine if I've had allergic reaction. Generally, if the allergic reaction is fairly minor, we think that it's probably fine. Uh, if it's more severe, you might want to defer for now until we have a little more experience with the vaccine. Um, we, you can also ask to be monitored a little bit longer in terms of our area uh, around where the vaccine is being um, given. And then if the patient has specific concerns, maybe discuss with their healthcare provider to make sure that it's going to be safe for them. And again, right now, we are not recommending it for breastfeeding or pregnant women at this time. It's not FDA approved. Um, obviously, if somebody felt it was extremely important that they get it, they might be able to receive it, but we're not recommending it this time. Next slide. So the question is how long, if you've had COVID-19, when should you get the vaccine? So we still recommend, even though people have had infection, um, that they wait, they still get the vaccine, but the wait time is approximately 90 days. So that's the current um, FDA recommendation. In terms of people who should not get the vaccine, it's not been approved for children and certainly not for people who have anaphylactic reactions to other products. They are researching this. I've not seen anything very recently. Um, so I'm guessing in the near future, we'll see something, but recently I did not see anything in terms of children. Uh, that's why we need to vaccinate the teachers. Next slide, I think. Um, continued precautions. Um, even though you've been vaccinated, people still could get the virus. So th the three W's, wear your mask, wash your hands as much as you can, and watch your distance. And again, if we're encouraging anybody, whether you're working or not working, if you're sick, please stay home. You don't need to spread this to other people. So if people have chronic illnesses or at risk of illnesses, they should talk to their physicians about what other measures they might be able to do to keep themselves healthy. And I think the next slide goes to Dr. Stewart. Sure. sure. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go through this slide. This is actually, it's a little bit uh, updated information from uh, the previous slide that went into the phases and tiers, because um, this just came out from the county uh, yesterday. 
and I was on a call with the county uh, earlier uh, today, this afternoon. But just real quickly, I just wanted to pause and just you know, thank everybody that's been involved with the rollout at our hospital. And Mary will go into more details, but it's been, uh, you know, you, everybody I think is aware of what a logistical and undertaking this is and all the challenges evolve from, from every level, from making it to distributing it to the, the national government, to the state government, down to the county, and then out to the facilities. And we started meeting uh, early, early in the fall, really, with a group uh, to try to plan and stay ahead. And it was very hard because we were working sort of uh, in the dark with respect to a lot of things, as everybody else. Uh, we did not have full information until a few weeks before the the, uh, the whole process went live, but really everybody from administration to nursing to IT, pharmacy, employee health, volunteer services, medical staff services, we've all been working together to make this happen. And I, I think Mary would agree, we're really proud of how the rollout has gone at our hospital. Um, again, being on these uh, weekly or sometimes uh, twice a week calls with the county, we hear feedback from other hospitals and you know, data Mary will show, share with you on the next slide really speaks to uh, what a great job we've done. And clearly with uh, distributing and, and giving actually over 2000 vaccines, um, you know, nothing is going to be perfect in this process, but I think we've really done an incredible job and we continue to plan ahead. Um, uh, going to this slide right now, uh, you know, we are in this phase. It's very confusing uh, for everybody um, by definition, I think, because we have the different phases and we have tiers within the phases and then we had tiers within the hospital, which now we've opened up to all the employees in the hospital. So the tiers within our hospital are less relevant now, but you can see that the, we're still in this phase 1A. And just to actually take a step back on that, different states are doing it differently. There's state... Um, Thank you. The states are able to kind of interpret the federal uh, guidelines and go, you know, bit in different directions. And even within our state, counties are doing it differently. So what might be happening in Southern California in a given county might not be happening here. Um, so again, that adds to the confusion I know for all of our patients. And it's, you know, we really are working hard to try to stay ahead of that. And again, the information changes. Um, as we heard today on the county call, uh, you know, basically almost every day in some cases. But we are under the jurisdiction of the county to make that clear. The county is uh, obviously under the jurisdiction of the state. So the, the state allots vaccine to the county. The county has then its own framework for distributing and uh, how they're going to do things within their jurisdiction, which is what we are within. Um, it's We've had uh, good communication with the county. I mean, in, in fairness to the county is hard as it is for us, it's hard for them because they, I think, are having uh, challenges getting clear information from the state. So it is it is a very fluid situation. But we are still in this phase 1A, which is essentially, you can think of it on a high level as all healthcare workers. And this, it, you know, they're listed here, I won't read them out, but it really goes beyond just doctors and nurses in the hospitals. That's what we first, uh, doctors, nurses, and all staff, I should say, in hospitals. That's what we first addressed. But you see these, these three tiers within the first phase, and now it's really been expanded to essentially anybody in, in healthcare that works in healthcare that has a, a patient facing uh, responsibility. And again, this has evolved over time and we got different guidance from the county a month ago than we're, we got last week. So if uh, people uh, you know, working in these areas were confused, uh, it's understandable. Um, what's coming next is uh, phase 1B. Um, again, from the information uh, we heard today that that the plan is for that to start in February. I don't know if it's February 1st, but hopefully within the first week or two of February. In this phase 1A hospital, there's been some pods within Alameda County. In other words, St. Rose uh, was a designated county site that the county staff. Otherwise, uh, hospitals were serving as facilities to vaccinate their, their own workers. As we go into phase 1B, it's going to be um, again, managed by the county. We don't know exactly how we are fitting into that outside of our own patients. In other words, we will be tasked with uh, the patients we have through our uh, WTMF. And, uh, you know, for sure, that is going to be our responsibility. And obviously, um, you know, Kimberly and everybody here are, are committed to being a point of distribution for our community. We do need to work within uh, guidance from the county on that. So, they know we want to be involved, so the details of how we would do that beyond uh, our own patients is all a work in process, and we will get more information soon. A couple of the big changes 
on these tiers just over the last week. If you'll notice in phase 1B was uh, initially uh, mostly 75 and over uh, residents and then essential workers in those categories was defined there and Dr. Martin mentioned. But uh, tier two, the next tier of phase 1B will now include uh, not just uh, other essential workers, but also everyone over 65 and over, um, as well as some other categories at the bottom of uh, that phase 1B um, column. And then phase 1C is, is also been uh, is a new thing with everybody over 50 and everybody uh, in ages 16 to 49 with various medical conditions like Dr. Martin uh, mentioned, whether it be uh, hypertension, diabetes, significant heart disease, uh, significant obesity, et cetera. So this is all being adjusted kind of on the fly. I think everybody uh, feels pretty good about where these phases are now. The uh, amount of vaccine that is coming out, I think everybody's probably aware that there was the initial doses were less than we, uh, enough to get our people vaccinated, enough to keep going as we are into the other health care tiers of uh, phase 1A but less than we had uh, initially anticipated coming right out of the gate. Uh, the word is that that is going, the pace of that is going to pick up, which I think is uh, part of the reason why these phases have been adjusted. They said, uh, the county being they, uh, said to anticipate over the next uh, three to four weeks, the, the supply vaccine will be significant. So. In, in concert with developing plans for our own patients, again, as I discussed, we are also in parallel making plans as to how we can help the community. And again, this is another area where we're trying to be as prepared as, as possible, um, given we're not sure what the ultimate eventuality will be. But um, we're kind of used to that now. And given everything that's going on otherwise with the surges and et cetera, and everything everybody in the hospital is dealing with. It's, it's a real uh, balancing act as far as resources. But uh, I, again, I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, that you know, compared to other organizations, I think we're really doing a great job. And uh, just wanted to make sure everybody uh, understood that as challenging uh, as it is. And so I, I think uh, we can uh, move on to the next slide, Mary, and then uh, maybe the three of us can take questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Um, yes, so as Dr. Stewart um, has given you some great background on the phases and um, Dr. Martin from the clinical perspective of it also, I would like to um, just share a little bit more further details with you about how we have um, been able to implement the vaccine here at the hospital in the last month. Uh, we did receive our first shipment on December 17th. That was an exciting day. Um, when it came in, uh, we were all there to sort of greet it and um, stored it carefully. There's a lot Lot of a management and um, security measures that you have to take. And uh, we took all of those at, as previously planned and were able to um, intake the vaccine well uh, to the point of where we were able to start providing vaccines uh, about 24 hours later after we uh, received it. So we did start giving our first vaccines on December 18th. And as of today, we have given over 2000 vaccines. That does include second doses of Pfizer. And um, this helps us to achieve a vaccination of about 70% of overall healthcare personnel. So this includes every um, discipline. And that's sort of one of the things I, I really like about the approach that we've taken here and and uh, we are working closely, of course, with our local authority, the county, on how we choose who we vaccinate. But we um, went to um, a lot of effort to make sure that regardless of what your discipline was, if you were at risk for coming face to face with uh, a patient that has COVID or that we think has COVID or in an area that's high risk for COVID, you were on the list to get the vaccine. And so we pulled together and got the appropriate resources on that. And um, in less than 30 days, we've been able to get to this mark of 70%. I do anticipate that obviously to go higher uh, because we are also collecting data on um, healthcare personnel that did not take the vaccine here. Uh, they received it someplace else. And uh, so that number will go up. And obviously we, we're continuing to offer the vaccine and continuing to do education and campaign to um, help everybody in the hospital understand um, the facts about the vaccine, why they should take it, and just make a well-informed decision about um, taking the vaccine. So again, I would expect that that uh, percentage will go up. 
We also um, have created a COVID vaccine task force. We actually created this a couple months prior to uh, the vaccine being released and pulled together all disciplines in the hospital um, to come together and have a meeting. And once we got the vaccine, we changed that meeting to daily. And so we continue to meet daily. And really, the, this is the planning group that um, follows um, through with support from our CEO and the VP team on sort of helping guide us um, um, on how we can give this vaccine uh, in a timely fashion, uh, make sure that it's done efficiently, and most of all, equitable. And I think that we've been able to do that. There's a lot of logistics planning in this, uh, scheduling, making sure you have the right location, making sure you communicate where people can get their vaccine, uh, making sure you have everything set up, all of that. So that's why it was important that this team came together and met daily, and we'll continue to do that for quite a while, uh, Dr. Stewart and I anticipate. Um, so it's maintaining day-to-day -day operations um, is something that we're focusing on, especially with the fact that now, as you heard from Dr. Stewart and Dr. Martin, we are um, expanding uh, the groups as these tiers come um, further open and available to us. This task force will have to maintain oversight of anticipating a second location of doing the vaccine so that we can offer it in a convenient place for the community members who are eligible to get it, that they can receive it, and um, community um, organizations that we're affiliated with, those sort of things we've been working with uh, to make sure that we can offer that expansion as soon as uh, it's approved by the county. Um, as our next steps, we'll continue to partner with the county. We have daily, almost daily conversations with them. We do have meetings with them, obviously shared with other uh, healthcare systems in the area. And we'll continue to um, make sure that we continue to have that partnership. And in, in that partnership, it's really important for us at Washington Hospital to um, really offer ourselves as a, um, as a source in the area for vaccines further for groups that uh, people beyond healthcare uh, providers. So we're continuing to work on that as one of our focuses. We also want to continue to keep the community and our healthcare personnel informed about where we're at with the vaccine supply, if, if it's available, when the next tiers are going to be available. This information is changing literally daily. And um, we feel like, you know, we have an obligation using forums such as this one um, to share the information with the community. I know that a lot of um, physicians and practices in the area are getting calls uh, daily because people are anxious to get the vaccine. And we want to make sure that we participate in keeping everybody as well informed as possible. So we'll continue to also have that be a focus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the members of the board? Are you using social media at all? Facebook or anything to communicate to your information? So we've done um, a couple things in our campaign. We have worked closely with community relations. Uh, there are some standard educational tools that you can use, and we've used those from the CDC and from the county and worked closely with them, and they've used social media to a certain extent on that. I think we, we can probably continue to do that further, especially when it gets more open to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, internally, we have daily communications that are going out to um, our, our staff and all healthcare personnel, just sort of keeping them up to date. It's our, part of our COVID daily uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. Doctor, I'm, I don't know, uh, maybe yeah, Dr. Nichols. I, I, I think that's- yeah, and so are there any other are there any other questions? I know I, I do want to thank Dr. Stewart and Mary and Dr. Martin. They have been working uh, endlessly on this, and you know we we will continue to get the word out to the community. I think that until we have a better sense of what um, how we're going to be doing the distribution to the community, that's when we'll we'll talk a lot more. And I know there will be a lot more discussion on really encouraging people to get it and why and all of those things that are really important. And we, and I think we've got a lot of really good ambassadors, those who are part of the healthcare system that have been vaccinated. We've talked a lot with the physicians and staff and others about really talking, talking to their neighbors and friends and family about the importance of getting the vaccine. 
And I do feel like a lot of that personal contact and, and touch along with social media and other campaigns um, will go a long way to get this community vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's been great work. Um, and we look forward to uh, continued uh, vaccination of our community. So at this point, we'll move on to our medical staff report. And I believe Dr. Killaroo is with us. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo from the medical staff standpoint uh, an appreciation for all the work that the hospital administration has been doing uh, in getting the vaccination to all of the healthcare providers. Um, just going back to what Ms. Yu said, uh, almost every doctor that I've seen that I'm friends on Facebook or social media has, have posted and all of us and we've been encouraging all of our physicians to talk to every patient and even myself, every patient that comes through the door. I mentioned that I got vaccinated, my experience and encouraging them to uh, participate in the vaccination program as well. Um, I'm happy to say I think at least 95% of the physicians um, and the allied health personnel have been vaccinated at least one dose. A majority of them have already gotten their second dose as well. Um, so I wanted to give that report. Um, we had a quarterly medical staff meeting yesterday that was very well attended, uh, where again, we uh, went over the hospital's plans for the vaccination and such. Um, we currently have uh, 588 physicians on staff, uh, 351 of which are active and 98 are ambulatory. So we've been hovering between that 575 to 600 uh, physician range uh, for a long time. We broke the 600 barrier once and then we kind of uh, staggered back down again. So hopefully when things get back to normal, we'll get more physicians back up here. As I mentioned at last meeting, we had the uh, cardiac surgery residents from UCSF start. And since then, we also have had the pediatric uh, fellows, uh, start one fellow start as well. So that program is up and running and um, hope to see it continue and uh, expand. And that's my report. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Killer. Any questions for Dr. Killer from the board members? If not, we'll move on to our quality report. And it looks like it's Mary Bowron and Dr. Martin up again for the 2021 Infection Prevention Program Plan. We're going to do the same approach with this. Dr. Martin will start off and then I'll do my slides. Okay. okay. Um, next slide. Uh, so as part of the background, we're looking at hospital acquired infections, HAI, um, and there's at least almost uh, 1.7 million per year, which is just overwhelming. So we really wanna see what we can do to try to improve that in our facility. Um, it's estimated that about 250,000 patients get admitted annually, um, and this contributes to the cost of the healthcare system of about 3.1 billion. Healthcare associated infections are in the top 10 leading causes of death in the US. Um, we're currently, we're monitoring these very closely at Washington Hospital um, with tracking these infections, and I'll get to more detail uh, and another couple of slides to tell you exactly which ones. Um, education, both to our staff and to patients. Uh, awareness and consistent um, application of updated evidence-based practice to make sure that we're providing a safe and um, germ-free environment for our patients. Uh, currently, infection prevention is hospital-wide discipline um, and it effectively prevents, identifies, controls the spread of infections. Um, it involves pharmacy, environmental services, dietary, um, physicians, nurses, and entire spectrum um, of our hospital um, workers. Next slide. So our infection prevention uh, committee was started in 2006 um, in response to the 5 Million Lives campaign. Um, it was first reported to the National Health Safety Network, it's NHSN, which I'll refer to quite frequently, uh, in 2009. Um, it's a 24-7 prevention and elimination of infections. We do an extreme amount of surveillance of the hospital environment, whether it's, it's pharmacy, or dietary, environmental services, laundry, 
uh, nurses, it's all over our hospital and very intensely monitored. Uh, we do real-time uh, reporting and analysis. We do have surveillance software. You may remember our ask uh, a couple of years ago when you gave us a very generous addition to the EPIC platform, which allows infection prevention to do a lot of tracking on this in very real time and very up to date. Uh, so this has been very meaningful in terms of our being able to sort out where our target areas are, uh, areas that need more work and areas that we've been able to accomplish a few successes. Um, we do the, generate the hospital infection, hospital acquired infection reports on a regular basis. Um, our committee is multidisciplinary. Um, I work as a physician consultant, in addition to Mary Bowen, um, who is Chief of Quality and Resource Management, our Infectious Disease uh, Program Coordinator, Paige Dijak. Uh, we have an infection prevention assistant, and her primary focus is education. Um, that's Diana DeMarta. Uh, and we have a part-time infection preventionist that provides mostly weekend coverage and ad hoc coverage, Laura Tang, who also works at another facility, which has been very helpful in terms of resources because sometimes we can say, well, at your facility, how do you solve this problem or how do you approach this? So that, that's been a very nice resource to have in several areas. We do have participation from all disciplines. So nursing, quality resource, compliance, patient safety, physician, central processing, environmental services, nutrition services, you can read all the rest. So it, it is multidisciplinary. And we had a meeting today and it was very well attended. We had almost 40 people on that Zoom call. So on one hand, the Zoom calls are a challenge because you're trying to communicate, but almost without being able to see the other person a lot, but it does facilitate our being able to get most people together, uh, even if they can only participate for a part of the meeting or something, because we get a lot more participation in our meetings with the Zoom calls. So we do encourage um, everybody to participate and to bring their concerns to the meeting. Next slide. Uh, so our key components of the program are quality and patient safety. Um, we um, work well with multidisciplinary teams, including the animal COVID stewardship, uh, employee health and safety, uh, transmission-based precautions, hand hygiene, huge factor, which does tend to kind of go up and down and fortunately has been up on the upswing lately. Uh, we do risk assessment for construction, which Mary will go into more detail. Uh, we also work on outbreak management. We did a huge uh, coordination when we were anticipating Ebola, and uh, this has generated another um, um, avenue with the COVID vaccine to make sure that we're staying up to date. Um, so there's a huge part of our program that's dedicated to the COVID response. Active surveillance is a very important, um, and we do primarily surgical site infections as well as the hospital acquired infections, which we'll touch base on in another couple of slides. We also work very diligently to update um, staff and provide patient education. We do annual employee education blitzes. We do orientation for new hires and also training on anything that comes up that's a change in process, a change in presentation, a change in the way that uh, certain procedures going to be done. Um, and I'll get to that in another couple of slides as well. We also try to focus and make sure that our interventions are evidence-based. Um, this includes the cleaning and disinfectant uh, practices, sterilization, uh, hand hygiene compliance, uh, management of multi-drug resistant infections, oversight of departments that work in infection prevention such as laundry, food, and nutrition. We also focus on employee education, orientation, and training. Next slide. So again, we, we coordinate with the National Health Care Safety Network, the NSHN. Uh, they're considered, quote unquote, our gold standard. So this is used primarily for benchmarking. So we can see how do we compare against other um, community-based or other uh, facilities of our same size and demographics. Um, and it does help us to sort of see where we can work to improve and make sure that we're providing best um, care for our patients and our staff. We also work through the Centers for Disease Control, which is uh, works coordinate, coordinates with the NSHN. Um, this is mostly voluntary, but I would say almost all the hospitals work through this um, organization to 
make sure that they are in compliance. Um, Medicare also looks at our data that's reported in SHN to see where we are with this. Um, it requires measurements of value-based per purchasing with this as well and hospital acquired condition reduction programs. And this primarily refers to the CAUTI, which is um, uh, central line antibiotic um, bloodstream infections. Uh, CAUTI is catheter associated urinary tract infections. SSI is surgical site infections, C. diff. MRSA is the multi-resistant um, staph aureus and BRE is vancomycin resistant enterococcus. So those are our major focuses that we're looking at in terms of infections, but we do look at several others in addition to that. Um, California Department of Public Health also helps us monitor this and they look at our NSHN data quarterly and benchmarks us against other hospitals in California. Um, so if we can compare nationally as well as locally. In terms of reporting our communicable diseases, uh, we work hand in hand with Alameda County Public Health Department as well. Next slide. So our prevention and control measures for 2021 include obviously the COVID. So we're currently screening for symptoms of COVID on anyone coming into um, our facility prior to arrival. Um, we immediately isolate any asymptomatic or high risk patients. We have instituted universal masking for everybody, especially patients. We have a safe restricted visitor policy and we've got mandatory COVID testing for almost all the surgeries uh, and elective surgeries are restricted during the COVID surges. All of our admitted patients are tested for COVID and we usually have the result prior to their being moved from a holding area from the ER up to the floors. So they've gotten very intense with this. And I think it's, it's helpful in terms of controlling infection within and without. Next slide. So the other measures that we're working on are the universal eye protection and the negative pressure rooms. We have worked very diligently with this. Uh, Robert and his team have been very helpful in terms of making sure that we have been able to convert rooms to negative pressure, which reduces spread of the infection. We have Environmental Services has increased our cleaning uh, for service decontamination. Uh, we've also maintained, and Nick and his team have been very diligent about making sure that we have adequate uh, personal protective equipment. I know other hospitals have struggled with this. Our hospital has really stayed on top and I think a lot of the employees are very, very comfortable that we are gonna provide enough materials for them to be safe and to do their work safe so that when they go home, they're not worried that they're gonna be themselves sick or bring something home to their family. We also are very uh, consistent about communicating and planning with the local skilled nursing facilities. I know Wendy and her team have worked with this. Dr. Chanta also has worked with this to make sure that early on when they didn't have PPE, we were working very hard to make sure that they had access to PPE, whether it was going through um, the state stockpiles or working with their corporate offices to make sure that they had enough PPE provided. Um, we've also been very helpful in trying to provide education to them as much as possible. So we're also adhering to strict respiratory hygiene, um, cough etiquette, hand hygiene, and very, very specific about doing physical distancing uh, between patients while waiting. And also like in our break rooms, we are very consistent about making sure that there is physical distancing. And you may also see it if you've been downstairs to the cafeteria, there's physical distancing signs down there as well. So we're definitely following all of the national standards for healthcare worker safety. Next slide. So additionally, what we've been doing, we have joint commission. Mary, is this your section or my section? Um, mine starts on 12, but I can. Okay, okay, all right. This too. See that okay, later. I can do it. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Are you on to? Okay. Okay, um, so for regulatory updates, um, they continue to increase in infection control. It's, um, it's something that's changing all the time. Uh, and Joint Commission, of course, is um, one of the groups that uh, we watch very closely related to 
the changes with their hospital national patient safety goals. So they continue to expand uh, goal number seven, which is solely focused on reducing the risk of healthcare associated infections. And there's, there's various subgroups to that. So um, they expect us to uh, comply with hand hygiene guidelines that Dr. Martin just mentioned, of course, uh, we'll continue to do that. And really looking at implementing evidence-based practices that are known to prevent the spread of hospital associated infections related to resistant organisms. I think one of the things that you hear frequently um, that we bring to the board are um, a surveillance with things like MRSA and VRE, you know, organisms that are really hard to treat with certain antibiotics. Well, the um, Joint Commission Group also uh, requires this as a focus area. And preventing uh, central line associated bloodstream infections uh, is, is another one of the focus areas and making sure that all your central lines that, are, that you have in place in your patients are only there when they need to be medically necessary. And that when they are in place that we use evidence-based practices like bundle prevention, things like that, to uh, make sure our patients don't develop uh, bloodstream infections from their central line. Um, that same um, practice applies to the um, evidence that they want us to implement around preventing surgical site infections. We've continued to see a lot of success in this area, very low surgical site infections here, especially with the volumes of surgeries we do in um, service lines like the joints. Uh, very, um, very rare do we have a surgical site infection there because we uh, so closely monitor evidence-based practices uh, that we have to have in place. And uh, lastly, uh, they um, want us to be focused on looking at what we're doing to prevent our patients from developing catheter, urinary catheter associated infections, otherwise known as CAUTI. Uh, so those are not um, really anything new for us. They've, um, they'll just continue to uh, probably expand further, but for right now in 2021, we'll be focusing on those areas. In addition to doing that, um, the group of uh, NHSN, uh, that works very closely with the CDC has expanded regulatory requirements around COVID reporting. Uh, this, this actually became uh, quite extensive this year. It moved very quickly once the pandemic started. Uh, obviously, the CDC wants to be collecting national data on this, and the data requirements are um, basically on a local, state, and federal level. On the local level, every single day, we have to report all of our COVID positives. And it's not just the patients that are in the house. It's any patient that came through the ED and then tested positive has to be reported um, locally. And we have time limits. Um, ours are, you know, daily that we have to report. That goes up to the state, and then it goes up to a federal level. We also input um, data about COVID, um, many elements of COVID, and details about the patients that have COVID into National Health Care safety network and that is done daily and i'll let dr martin proceed from here yeah including the daily is actually saturday sunday on holidays that's so it, it is daily yeah it's been that's probably been one of the biggest challenges of it you're correct <laughs> all right next slide So this is our prevention risk assessment for the calendar year of 2021. Uh, so it, it's it's very small print, um, but what we did is try to figure out what were our highest risk um, uh, potential areas for infection. Um, and you can see hand hygiene and PPE ranked up there pretty high. MRSA is also very high. COVID ranked very high, um, and then device-associated um, infections, which is the catheter-related bloodstream and the catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Uh, we're also looking at contaminated instruments, uh, scopes, and cleaning. Um, this year, we updated to include water and Legionella management safety. Uh, I'm happy to say we haven't had a problem, but we want to make sure that we don't have one. If we do have one, it gets recognized pretty well. Uh, C. diff has always been something that we are working on and some days or some weeks more of a struggle than others. I think it's been relatively stable lately, uh, but certainly a challenge when we're seeing more and more and more and more ill patients. And this gets to be quite an issue when we are as over... Um, overwhelmed with patients because you can probably look at our census. We've been reaching up to the 200 almost every day this week. So with that, staff are stressed. We want to make sure they're not doing shortcuts and trying to take care of patients. And I think so far we're doing very well trying to hold that under control. 
Um, we also, with animal coverage stewardship, focus on um, what we call CRE, which is carbapenem associated resistant enterobacteriaceae. Carbapenem is a specific group of antibiotics that are we consider our workhorse. And what we use them for is most of our resistant um, infections and we want to make sure that we're not seeing resistance to these um, bacteria. We have not, these antibiotics, we have not seen much of that, but it's something we continue to monitor very closely. Uh, next slide. So the key practice strategies that we're trying to implement for 2021 um, is developing a process of near real-time um, evaluations of our hospital acquired um, infections and data, uh, update training and competency for staff on infection prevention policies. And again, with staffing being so tight with our high census, this has been a bit of a challenge, but certainly working on it in terms of the charge nurses with their daily huddles and flyers where we can do things like that and try to provide extra education. I think the nurses are very appreciative of the work that the infection prevention team has been able to provide. Uh, we're also targeting new nurses. Um, the other thing that has been something that has been a huge um, uh, boon for our nurses when they get very burnt out or we have a lot out on sick, we've been able to acquire nurses from some of the other departments in the hospital and have been putting them through what they consider a boot camp so that they can help in other areas that they're not as familiar with. So we're targeting new nursing, but also nurses that are new to a particular area with education. We recently revised our C. diff uh, testing flow sheet because we felt that the nurses did not have enough specific information. Uh, we've posted this in almost all of the nursing units, and it's also posted on our isolation card. So if somebody has a question, the information is right there. Uh, we're also working on the catheter-associated urine checked infection and central line bloodstream infection prevention bundle. In other words, how to address proper cleaning and maintenance of any of these um, devices. We have a new C. diff prevention bundle that we're working on and not quite ready for uh, real time yet, but working on that right now. We've updated environmental services and cleaning and sanitizing systems. Obviously this is to match the COVID need. Uh, continued areas that we're working on are providing real time data and initiatives, investigating new methods for hand hygiene and compliance monitoring. Uh, we're doing uh, daily rounding on isolation patients to make sure that there's compliance with the policies. And this is especially uh, high need in terms of our um, COVID pandemic uh, patients and the responses needed for there. We're working in collaboration with other healthcare facilities, UCSF, to make sure that you know, what we're doing meets standard for some of the other hospitals. Uh, we are immunizing eligible um, healthcare providers, community members, and patients uh, for the COVID vaccine as resource available is, is provided throughout the year. We're continuing to enforce the transmission-based uh, PPE policies and universal source control, um, such as mask and eye protection. I can tell you right now, it's really nice to be able to talk without the mask on because that we're at, I feel like 24 seven. So this is a really nice break. <laughs> Okay, next slide. Okay, this is yours, Mary, I think. Okay, so um, getting into our um, surveillance of, um, well, there are many things that we uh, do surveillance on, and I, don't, I won't go into listing all of them here, but I'll just uh, count on a couple of these. Uh, we're obviously continuing to um, look and watch COVID carefully. And as I mentioned before, um, all of the infections that are difficult to treat with antibiotics, device related infections, and um, of course, influenza is something that we will be focusing on 2021 also beginning in September. Next slide. Um, it seems interesting uh, to me, and I think to a lot of people, you don't think of infection control as being associated with monitoring construction uh, projects. But in fact, infection control is uh, very involved in that process. And it's because construction, process, constru construction projects um, can often lead to um, sort of things being in the air and uh, aerosols coming through uh, certain areas that are opened up for constructions and putting uh, patients and our healthcare workers at risk. So infection control works really closely 
closely with all people in charge of construction here to make sure that all construction sites, even little things that are done in people's offices, right up to things done in patient care settings, are monitored and reviewed for risk prior to starting the construction. We rank them on a classification anywhere from low to high. And um, once that's done, proper measures are put into place that make the construction able to proceed that safely on um, protecting our patients and our employees. Next slide. Another area that we closely monitor is water management. There are a lot of things that go on with water management regulation in any healthcare system, um, but infection control does participate in a part of that. This has actually been a requirement from NHSN since uh, early 2018. And it basically includes that we um, work with the engineering team on making sure that the, we're doing proper temperature monitoring and we test all the water for bacteria to make sure that um, the water is clean and safe. Uh, we did update our water management protocol and uh, making it um, ex more expansive and looking at uh, water testing uh, more frequently, which I think has helped because uh, that will improve the surveillance for any issues that may arise. And uh, we work uh, closely with that outside vendor uh, to make sure that this data is brought up to us in a, uh, on a frequent basis and on, on a way that we can all review it uh, appropriately and intervene on any um, issues that arise. So overall, uh, I feel really comfortable with the uh, water management plan that infection control works closely with engineering on. And it's, a, it's another great addition to um, the safety that we have here at the hospital. Next slide. EVS is a huge part of infection prevention, uh, and it will continue, obviously, throughout this year. Um, we um, do have great daily rounding and monitoring that we work with um, the environment and care staff on, and we do that in conjunction uh, with both infection control working with EVS. Uh, we work with them a lot on education, especially with COVID. We've uh, worked very closely with them on the cleaning protocols associated with that. There's continuous one-on-one -on -one education, et cetera. Another thing is looking closely at the disinfectants we use, right? Always making sure that we have the best disinfectants and that they're safe for the environment and at the same time are appropriate in um, killing off bacteria bacteria and viruses. We also use a uh, type of testing that's called ATP taste testing uh, without getting into too much detail. Basically what this is, is it's an electronic device that you can actually um, swab an area after it's been cleaned to make sure it was cleaned appropriately and it gives you a reading. And if it's at a certain too high of a reading, then you need to re-clean the area. And if it um, is um, in a, in a controlled uh, limit setting and you know that your cleaning is being done efficiently. Uh, we can do this on spot checks. Uh, EVS is great. They use it um, for their own educational tool also on their cleaning practices. We work closely with them on that. Um, so I think that this, um, in, this working closely with EVS is a really big important part of infection control, especially in a time like COVID. Next slide is Dr. Martin. Okay. Um, so talking about animal code stewardship, um, this was started um, in June of 2016 as a requirement for uh, Medicare and Medicaid services. We started our team in 2010. Uh, again, it's interdisciplinary. Um, we are work with the lab, the pharmacy, um, nursing, um, and the physicians. Uh, we're looking at our drug utilization in terms of specifically our high um, uh, high risk antibiotics, like I was mentioning, the carbapenems. Um, the IDs have been able to work together on usage guidelines, and we provide education for the physicians as well as nursing staff and pharmacy. Uh, we have a dedicated pharmacist, Lena Wong, who has worked with our team since its inception and is very up to date and keeps all of us going on the latest and greatest changes. Um, we are looking at antibiotic cross-sensitivity program. In other words, patients that uh, come in with a history of penicillin allergy when some penicillin antibiotic related would be best used for these patients in terms of either desensitization or getting more accurate history. Uh, some of them mentioned nausea has been an allergic reaction, which obviously probably is not, or at least not severe. So that if a penicillin is needed specifically for their particular infection, it can be used with safety. We are also using um, EPIC, which was uh, a huge packet that the board gave to us uh, a couple of years ago, um, which helps us update our um, 
our order-based panels. Um, we're trying to improve uh, and update our multi-top, which uh, got sort of put on the back burner because we were working on the COVID uh, testing at the time and we're hoping to sort of bring that back online. Again, we are submitting data to NSHN, uh, which helps us benchmark ourselves against other hospitals and also working on best practices advisories, which the EPIC provides as well. Next slide. Um, so this is one of the areas that we're working on primarily is our C. diff because we think this is something we totally could control and it does cause significant um, uh, comorbidity in patients either in terms of making their hospital stay longer or in some exacerbating an underlying illness. So it is a contagious bacterial infection that causes severe GI disease and it's usually associated with prolonged um, antibiotic use. Uh, C. diff rates have increased across the country uh, primarily because of use of the antibiotics and also some of the more comprehensive broad spectrum antibiotics which tend to induce uh, the, the development of C. diff. Management obviously is hand hygiene over and over again um, and management of antibiotics so that we are using the best antibiotic for the least amount of time for the best results for the patient. So Washington Hospital started a housewide C. diff prevention prevention program in 2016 um, with me and also some of the nurses, we do root cause analysis and trying to figure out where we have areas where we could work to improve. Um, we also are working again with EVS and other uh, the nurses to make sure we're doing a cleaning matrix and hand hygiene to make sure that that's as good as we can get. And then collaboration with the nurses, we revised our C. diff bundle. In other words, when they're looking at a patient with diarrhea, what are the appropriate steps that they need to take to protect themselves, protect the patient, and make an accurate diagnosis. Um, environmental services has a very specialized team that works on the C. diff, uh, the patient's rooms that have infections for C. diff to make sure that these are clean top to bottom because they were using bleach in addition to the regular um, antiseptics. Uh, Infection prevention is working on education. Uh, we uh, updated our isolation signs. They are color coded so that the nurses can recognize them and as well as EBS recognize them right away uh, to know that this is a patient that needs enhanced precautions. Um, pharmacy helps us with doing the drug bug matching. And we at one point we're working on a fecal transplant protocol that kind of got put on the back burner with the development of coded, but we're hoping to sort of bring that back forward again at some point. Um, we also have a suspected C. diff testing decision flow street, which helps the nurses when they're looking at a patient to try to decide what's best steps to manage these patients. Uh, currently our infection ratio is below the national benchmark. We have had ups and downs, but in the last several um, quarters much improved. And again, as you can see, the pictures using the, the bleach uh, wipes, which is specifically indicated for C. diff, and also making sure that we're doing gallon gloves and protecting our staff as well as uh, patients and other patients to whom the spread might. Um, one second. Might impact. I'm not sure why my computer keeps doing that. It wants to take a break. Next slide. Uh, so this is what our sign looks like. So you can see very clearly it says stop. So check to make sure you're washing hands. And again, we want to make sure that in addition to the hand sanitizer, people are washing their hands with soap and water. This is very specific to the C. diff. Again, make sure that people going in the rooms are wearing uh, the proper PPE with the, the gowns, the gloves, and um, obviously we're all wearing masks anyway. Um, and the bleach wipe is what's needed. So if the patient is, has C. diff, they need to stay away from the common areas. A lot of this is slightly outdated with the COVID, but make sure those patients are staying in their rooms as much as possible. And they're not allowed at any time to go into the common areas such as the gift shop or cafeteria. Uh, this is the education that's provided to the patient. Um, and then if for some reason we do have a visitor who's gonna come in to visit a C. diff, patient, they're also required to wear the same PPE, washing their hands with the soap and water, using the gowns and the gloves. And again, we don't allow any eating or drinking inside the patient rooms except for the patient themselves. Next slide. 
So this is the information we provide to a patient when it's time to go home so they know what they need to do so they don't have the potential for spreading this infection to other people in their household. And again, we emphasize washing with soap and hands with soap and water. Uh, some people think it's more the friction than anything else, but washing the hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, which is singing happy birthday to yourself twice. Um, very important that the patients wash their hands before and after using the bathroom, before and after preparing food and eating, uh, to use cloth towels to dry hands or disposable. Um, clean surfaces with disinfectants lead specifically the bleach is considered the most effective and they probably should be using disposable gloves when doing any cleaning surfaces, not just bathrooms, any cleaning surfaces. Recommend changing and washing linens with hot water on a regular basis. Um, and if a patient is given a prescription for treatment of C. diff to make sure that they take the medications exactly as prescribed and make sure they take the entire prescription, uh, not to share with anybody else. Um, the other thing we encourage patients if they go home and they have another family member that might be developing the C. diff that they contact their healthcare provider as soon as they uh, are concerned or notice any potential diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain, uh, et cetera. Uh, next slide. The other thing we're working on is tuberculosis surveillance. Um, we worked very closely with um, radiology department and that they would be seeing a chest X-ray that they thought might be suspicious for a patient who's coming in for another diagnosis, but seeing a chest X-ray that looks suspicious for um, tuberculosis because some uh, patients can have developed this in the past, recovered, but have reactivation that may not be aware of. They may be coughing and thinking it's just allergy. So when the radiologist was seeing a chest x-ray specifically that they thought was highly suspicious. They were notifying um, uh, infection control right away and then we would follow up with the physician and also with the nursing um, if it's an inpatient uh, to make sure that these patients got put in isolation and the issue addressed as soon as possible because we felt we were reducing potential spread. At one point, we had almost 500 employees who had been exposed to unrecognized TB in patients. That has dramatically dropped. I think we have probably maybe a handful now at best. So our policy is to have 100% of employees have annual TB screening. It's also um, offered to physicians. And as physicians, we are required to get the flu shot and an updated uh, TB test, or, or um, if you've had positive PPD in the past, you document that. We, are do, it, we do it every, every year, we're required. We also work very closely with Alameda County to monitor and survey any patients that are coming in uh, or patients that are being discharged to make sure that we coordinate the care, especially those that might be going to a skilled nursing facility. The nurses are very keen on starting the airway in isolation on any suspect patients. Uh, they are going into next negative pressure rooms. Uh, we are encouraging the physician to contact um, any of the ID team. And also we have uh, protocols for uh, submitting uh, specimens to the lab. Respiratory works very carefully with um, the nurses and the physicians to make sure that these are collected in a certain programmed staggered fashion that we have put together. And then the county is also an updated by infection prevention team. So this collaboration is very important to make sure that the patient is well taken care of, the patient's gonna be safe, but also providing a safe environment for our own staff. Cause we really don't want this to get to be a problem. I think we've worked on it very, very hard and gotten dramatic improvement. Uh, and then the patients at the time of discharge are educated with a flyer and specific um, information regarding their medications and any follow-up that they might need to do. And then in addition to that, the county also follows up on these patients very closely. Next slide. Okay. So I think that's back to you, Mary. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, keeping our staff educated is just as important as keeping our patients educated, right? So it, we have to work to make sure that they are continually um, updated about changes in healthcare and is especially related to infectious disease. So we do have the staff, 100% uh, of them complete uh, annual infection prevention education. They use this through an electronic uh, 
service that we have here. Uh, we also use multiple other modes of education, um, material like presentations, flyers, posters, our huddles throughout the hospital that happen every day on um, all units and departments throughout the hospital. Uh, most of them include some form of infection prevention education. This year, we've really um, built this model um, solid because of COVID. And I think we've actually made a lot of improvements in the structure of how we keep the staff educated uh, through what we've learned in COVID. And we'll continue to use that structure uh, throughout the um, year. Next slide. The um, specific education that we give uh, patients on COVID um, have related to things, a lot of things around testing uh, and especially patients that test positive. Um, they've required, of course, extra education that we try to have um, brought to them through a provider format. So um, a physician, nurse practitioner, et cetera. Uh, we've also been able to use electronic resources and print off electronic education for patients so that they have it more accessible for those of them who don't have access to electronic um, access to finding out more information about COVID. Um, we've also um, tried to do a lot of community outreach education, um, such as through um, any COVID updates that we give on forms that we've mentioned prior to this. On the right-hand side, you can just see an example, very simple, um, high-level uh, education on COVID that we try to hand to everybody. And of course, with the changes that come, um, we keep this all up to date. And so it's, it's an important part of of our patient education and it will be for throughout 2021, we imagine. Next slide. So the future direction of uh, this program uh, will of course um, be very focused on COVID as I have listed down here later on the slide. But I think what's important is that we want this program to run also in addition to um, things outside of COVID, right? We have, have to make the hospital, continue to make the hospital safe um, as we have done and uh, focusing on infection prevention uh, methods that are, go beyond just focusing on COVID. So we'll do that and we'll do that in compliance with uh, what the CDC is recommending and CMS, uh, et cetera. We'll continue to use the structure that we've used here for many years, which is the medical staff working closely with administration in various committees to make sure that all this information goes from the bed side all the way up to the board. And um, that structure has been very helpful on uh, relaying information and making changes to improve the program. Um, all this will be focused on reducing healthcare associated infections uh, with the protocols that we have in place. But we really want to sustain those improvement initiatives throughout 2021, in addition to making sure that we stay up to speed with our COVID response planning. So I think that's one of the things that we want to emphasize. Improvement efforts are gonna continue to happen in in conjunction with how we manage COVID. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin and uh, Dr. and uh, Mary. Any questions from the board members? Well, that's quite a comprehensive uh, presentation and obviously you've been doing a tremendous amount of very valuable work in addition to dealing with uh, COVID, the challenge of COVID this past year. Um, it's, it's a marvelous uh, job that you've done, uh, and it's great to see the improvement on many facets of infection prevention with antibiotic stewardship and C. diff. Well, uh, we, have, we have a huge team, and I, I have to say the nurses have been very receptive to education opportunities, and I think that includes you know, environmental services, pharmacy, all the disciplines. So it's an entirely housewide team effort. Yeah, it's all it's all hands on deck because infection infection prevention is uh, essential to delivering the best of care in a safe environment. And that's that's a main goal of our work. So thank you again for your great work and for the presentation tonight. So if there's other questions, you could forward those to me later. I'm going to sign out now. If that's okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. We'll now move on to our finance report with uh, Chris Henry. We'll be looking at Washington Hospital's operating and financial results for November. Uh, yeah. There we go. Um, 
Um, okay, um, looking at our acute inpatient statistics, average daily census for the month, um, a little bit higher than, than budgeted, 142.3. Admissions, as you can see, were 59 below budget, but patient days were higher than budget by 99. So uh, that indicates a longer length of stay uh, uh, at 4.99, we'd expected 4.95 in the budget. Our outpatient observation equivalent days for the month came in at 206, uh, about 38 above the budget of 168. Moving to utilization. Um, case mix index for the month, um, lower than what we've seen in the past several months, but still higher than expected at 1.59. This is, again, our indication of the severity of the case, the patients we saw in the hospital. We'd ex on the budget, we'd expected a case mix index of 1.499. Deliveries for the month were uh, relatively strong at 132. That was six above the budget. Surgical cases uh, came in just five below budget at 356, and we'll see the details of that in just a second. Cath lab procedures were 20 above the budget at uh, 376. Outpatient visits for the month, 513 lower than budget at 6,530. Our emergency room visits, excluding um, RSTU visits, were 502 below budget at 3,361. And our RSTU visits, likewise, were 165 below budget at uh, 1,889. Uh, looking quickly at the detail for uh, OR and cath lab, uh, 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 neurosurgical cases in the OR and um, general surgery were uh, pretty close to budget for the month. Really that negative variance driven uh, in the area of joint replacements and um, cardiac surgical cases. In the cath lab, um, uh, peripheral vascular procedures and cardiac procedures were relatively strong and really drove that positive variance non-vascular and neurointerventional inter radiology activity offset uh, some of that activity, uh, but really um, not a bad month in the cath lab. Moving to productivity, our productive FTEs for the month uh, were 22.9 uh, above the budget at 1,253.8. Non-productive FTEs for the month were 47.2 uh, higher than budget at 218.5, giving us total FTEs that were 70.1 higher than budget at 1,472.3. Our FTEs per adjusted occupied bed, which is our productivity measure, not quite where we would have liked to have seen it in the month. Uh, at 6.64, we'd expected 6.42. Moving into financials. Um, total patient revenue for the month came in um, uh, about $3.1 million higher than budget at $162,924,000. Uh, contractuals for the month came in, as we've seen most of the year, higher than budget, but not quite as, uh, as magnified as we have seen. Um, uh, our contractual allowances uh, for payers that were contracted with came in um, actually a little bit lower than budget at 75.38%. Uh, however, our provision for bad debt and charity came in uh, higher than we had expected at 2.57% of gross revenue. We'd expected just over 2%. So we ended up with net revenue for November um, about $629,000 lower than budget at $36,728,000. Operating expenses for the month were 2.2 million higher than budget at 40,462. And the themes here are familiar uh, and consistent with what we've seen this year. Uh, our salaries and benefits really drove the majority of that of that uh, variance with our salaries coming in a million four higher than budget. Benefits came in uh, about $540,000 higher than budget. We did have higher health and welfare costs in the month. And of course, when we have higher uh, salaries, our employer taxes uh, go up. Um, also uh, contributing to that variance is our pro fees and purchase services. 
um, uh, they were driven higher by medical fees um, and medical services, specifically reference labs uh, for COVID testing, as that volume just has not uh, let up. Um, also, our legal fees, legal and construction, or excuse me, consulting fees were, were down 105,000, and also our training and travel and recruitment expenses were below budget. So we ended up the month with an operating loss um, that was 2.8 million lower, or excuse me, worse than budget at $3,734,000. Not operating income um, came in pretty close to budget, um, uh, 52,000 lower at 5,000. 5, we budgeted 57,000. Really, the big driver for this month is our, our uh, rental income as our tenants continue to experience the effect of, of COVID. Uh, many are not renewing leases, many are needing help, and we're really trying to work with our tenants as best we can to help get them through this, uh, this period. So we ended up um, uh, with a total bottom line. This again is from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board uh, point of view with a net income uh, about uh, almost $2.9 million worse than budget at three million, uh, with a loss of 3,729,000. Quick look at the Financial Accounting Standards Board presentation. This is the way uh, the financial markets might uh, adjust our GASB um, financials when they look at us. We reclassify $719,000 of interest expense on our revenue bonds out of non-operating up back into operating expenses. That uh, changes those expenses uh, to 41 million eight hundred, excuse me, $181,000 a little less than $2.2 million higher than budget and changes our operating income uh, to 44, excuse me, $4,453,000. Non-operating income from a FASB perspective, uh, we then eliminate uh, the interest expense related to our GO bonds and the related uh, tax revenue and eliminate our small unrealized loss on our investments to come up with non-operating income from a FASB perspective, $108,000 lower than budget, $430,000, and a total bottom line from a FASB perspective uh, showing just a little bit over a $4 million loss. Quick look at earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, this gives us an idea of how much income the operation after eliminating non-cash items uh, we're generating. We eliminate depreciation out of our operating bottom line uh, to come up with EBITDA uh, of $302,000. We had expected uh, $3,131,000 in the budget. Uh, likewise, we go down below the line and adjust out our interest expense from our non-operating income and our non-operating activities generated about a million, almost a million nine in, uh, in income for the month. So combined uh, operation, operating and non-operating activities generated uh, about 2.2 million for debt service and for uh, other things such as capital and uh, new programs and program development. So are there any questions on the results uh, from November? Any questions? If not, let's please go on to the operations report. All right. Uh, this evening I'm going to present uh, the December operations report. Um, gross revenue of $183.3 million for December was above budget by $16.9 million or 10.2% and above December of 2019 by $6.8 million or 3.8%. Uh, inpatient gross revenue of $123.3 million was above budget by $19 million or 18.2% and $5.6 million or uh, 4.8% above December of 2019. Outpatient gross revenue of $60.1 million was below budget by $2 million, 3.3%, but $1.2 million or 2% above December of 2019. I do just want to note as we get into uh, these, uh, this information for the operations report, in December, we did see the highest number of COVID-19 uh, positive cases since the start of the pandemic. 
And, uh, you know, as uh, we've had to implement a, a tiered response plan in terms of being able to handle this increase in, in COVID volume. And this did include, and you will see that we did, uh, we implemented a number of initiatives, including uh, the need to curtail elective uh, surgeries at, um, in the middle of the month. So uh, this did have an uh, impact on um, some of the, the revenue and some other areas. And you will also see that especially the increase in the COVID-19 cases is reflected in the higher patient acuity and the longer length of stay. And basically, this is for, these metrics are further compounded by the uh, curtailment of the procedures. So I just wanted to um, make sure that everybody was aware of that. So moving on in terms of the key statistics, the average length of stay of 5.67 was above the budget of 4.83 by uh, 0.84 or 17.4%, resulting from the higher acuity of the admitted patients. Um, the average length of stay was also longer uh, than in the December 2019 average length of stay of 4.6 by 1.07 or 23.3%. Outpatient observation days were 6 or 3.3% below budget at, 100, uh, at 178 days. Average daily census of 168.3 was above the budget of 135.1 by 33.2 or 24.6%. Uh, the average daily census of, uh, was 21 or 14.3 percent above December of 2019 uh, by 21 or 14.3 14 percent. Uh, so then, as you can see, we had a long um, length of stay, but our emissions were below budget by uh, 62 or 7.2 percent. And again, emissions for the month were 173 or 17.7 percent below December of, of 2019. Uh, patient day trends, uh, while missions were below budget by 7.2%, patient days of 5,217 were above budget by 1,030 or 24.6%. This was the result of the longer average length of stay we experienced during the month. Uh, patient days for the month were 651 or 14.3% above December of 2019. The surgical trend, total surgical cases in December of 332 were below budget by 32 or 8.8%. Inpatient surgeries were 32 or 18.5% below budget at 141. And outpatient surgeries were on budget at 191. Look, just uh, looking at the breakdown, joint replacement surgeries were below budget by 22 or 13.8%. Uh, joint replacement surgeries were 5 or 3.8% above December of 20, uh, 2019. General surgical procedures were below budget by 9 or 5.3%, and they were 37 or 18.6% below December of 2019. Neurosurgical procedures were below budget by 1 or 4.5%, and they were five, or 1 above, the, but above December of 2019. And lastly, our cardiac surgery procedures were on budget, um, and they were 2 or 14.3% below December of 2019. Uh, looking at our cath lab trend, uh, cath lab procedures for December of 315 were 35 or 10% below budget and 206 or 39.5% below December of 2019. Inpatient cath lab procedures were below budget by 38, 19.4% and 158 and 127 or 44.6% below December of 2019. Uh, outpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by 3 or 1.9% and 157, but below the prior year by 79 or 33.5%. Looking at the, uh, the breakdown of the cath lab uh, activity, you can see here that peripheral vascular procedures were below budget by 60 or 37.7%. Our cardiac procedures were below budget by 20 or 16.3%. Our neurointerventional radiology procedures were above budget by 1, or, uh, which is 25%. And our non-vascular interventional radiology procedures were above budget by 44 or 68.8%. Uh, looking at our deliveries, um, our deliveries uh, were down in December. They were at 109, which were below budget by 43 or 28.3%. And they were, uh, deliveries were 38 or 25.9% below December of 2019. 
I have heard from other hospitals that are also seeing a decline in, in uh, deliveries. I think uh, there seems to be that um, maybe not as given what's been the pandemic that everybody's been experiencing, there's, it seems to be a reduction potentially in the number of deliveries. So this could have an impact going forward for, for a period of time too. Uh, Non-ER outpatient trend um, or non-emergency outpatient visits of 6,934 were above budget by 260 or 3.9%. Uh, and you can, uh, these visits were below December 2019 by 356. Uh, those that were above, the areas above budget were lab visits, um, were above budget by 500. Infusion center visits were above budget by 67. And lymphedema, EKG, outpatient, and, and diabetes combined were above budget by 202. That, that was offset by the areas that were running below budget, which cardiac rehab visits were below budget by 242 and x-ray visits were below budget by 278. Looking at our emergency room trend, uh, emergency room visits uh, 4,211 were close to budget, were below, but they were below the same period of last year by 407 or 8.8% visits. Uh, the Rapid Screening and Treatment Unit, RSTU, of 1,440 visits were below budget by 682 or 32.1%. Uh, in the middle of the month, uh, in December, on December 14th, we did close the RSTU unit, and we've moved um, all of the pre-procedure testing um, uh, into the um, old emergency department, um, and that opened in December of 2016. So we're doing uh, a lot of our COVID testing, all of our COVID testing for for those um, procedures that need to be done before procedures or OR or, or, or cases and others are now being done um, over there so that we can uh, work on getting them efficiently through. Uh, gross revenue, uh, let's go over that recap. Our surgical cases were below budget by 32, 8.8%, driving surgical services revenue down by 2.6 million or 7.8%. Our cath lab procedures were below budget by 35 or 10%, and we had an unfavorable procedure mix, so that drove cath lab procedure revenue down by 2.2 million, or 17.5%. As mentioned, deliveries were below budget by 43, driving birthing center revenue by, uh, down by 1 million, or 26.9%. Our inpatient days uh, were above budget by 1,030, and patient acuity was also high, driving room and board revenue up by 8.9 million or 28%. Uh, the higher level of inpatient activity um, drove ancillary services revenue above budget by 14.4 million or 19.7%. Looking at our uh, preliminary payer mix, uh, you'll see that our total government sponsored was 73.2%. Um, of total gross revenue, this is higher than the budget of 2.5% and higher than the prior year 3.7%. I think usually what we have seen in the past in sort of those normal years, it's a time, December is usually the time when a number of people do certain elective cases or get elective procedures done because it's, it's usually the end of their benefits year. And so given the COVID uh, pandemic, we really did not see that um, happen this year and it, it definitely has impacted our, our payer mix from that side. So you'll see HMO was 3% of gross revenue, which is above budget by 2.7% and higher than the prior year of 2%, but our PPO was 22.1% of gross revenue, which is below the budget of 24.6% and lower than the prior year of 26.6%. And then our private pay was 1.7% of gross revenue, which is below the budget of 2% and lower than the prior year of 1.9%. Uh, moving on to our productive indicators, um, our productive FTEs were above budget by 132 or 11% at 1,331.8. Our non-productive FTEs were below budget by 31.1 or 12.8% at 211.5. Uh, our total FTEs of 1,543.3 were above budget by 100.9 or 7%. But you'll really see this in our in our other uh, productivity per AOB. 
Our variance very much is driven by volume, about 108.7 of it. Um, and if you adjust the volume, uh, the flex budget was 1,551.1. So if you look at our productive FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 5.32, we're lower than the budget of 5.57 by 4.5%. And our total FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 6.17 were lower than the budget of 6.69 or 7.8%. So given the, the higher volume, um, our productivity measures um, were in line. And we also had a number of incremental FTEs for COVID. Uh, we have a number of staff that have acquired COVID um, through the community. And so we have a number of staff that are out um, with that. We also had added additional resource nurses given the increase in the volume of COVID and also vaccination staff or some of those. So moving on to our preliminary outpatient statistics, um, you can see our Whitmouth uh, clinic visits were below budget in December by 246 or 1.6% 1 at 15,076. We've also now broken down um, our other outpatient visits by site, and you can see overall 2,739 uh, visits uh, from these other sites were below budget by 343, or 11.1% for the month of December. You can see in the specific areas, Washington Radiation Oncology Center, our treatments were up. I do want to say as of December um, 23rd, I believe it's the, towards the end of that December month, we opened our linear accelerator at the, uh, we implemented our new linear accelerator at the Radiation Oncology Center. So we're very excited to now be back serving our community in the Fremont location. Uh, so that happened this uh, in December. You can see our urgent care visits are um, below budget by 288, our um, Washington Outpatient Surgery Center by 26. Um, outpatient Rehab Center by six, and Arloni College Student Center by 32. Moving on to our key financial statistics and charity, um, our days cash on hand for December ended at 163 days. It's a decrease of six days from the last month, um, mainly due to two, two pieces. Um, the, we had a quarterly pension funding of 9.9 .9 million that we made in December. Uh, which included a deferred amount of 3.3 million. So usually um, our pension funding is about 6.6 .6 million. So we added that one, uh, the deferred payment of 3.3, which was from March of 2020. So that um, had an increase in of eight days. It was also partially offset by uh, federal supplemental programs. We did receive 4.2 million from our prime program in terms of the quality metrics, and we also did. Um, and IGT uh, funding for our hospital quality assurance fee. Our days of gross revenue and accounts receivable were 61. We do uh, have seen a higher volume of high dollar, high acuity patients compared to last year, which is, which is impacting our days in AR. Um, I do just want to say a couple things in terms of, of funding. Um, we have the CARES Act, the third uh, wave of funding um, from the CARES Act. Uh, we it was opened in November for application, and we did apply. Um, at this point, we are waiting to hear whether or not we will be given any additional funding through that. Um, we sh it opened in uh, the end of December, beginning of January, and they have until the end of January to to allocate funding to to uh, additional funding to providers. We've also, they're in the, in the HEROES Act that was recently passed by the federal government. There is some additional funding in there. And so um, once that ha opens up and we look at what how to apply, we will be applying for funding. Because again, additionally, um, a, lot, a great deal of our financials have been impacted by not only the expenses and the initiatives we've had to implement to ensure the safety of our our patients and our staff and our physicians, but also we've uh, seen that impact that COVID has had on our volume and specifically surgical volume and, and others too. So I just uh, wanted to let the board know about that. And then uh, uh, that is the end of uh, December operational. Thank you, Kimberly. Any 
questions for Kimberly regarding uh, December operations? Looks like it was a challenging month and it feels like uh, January 2021 is uh, likewise going to be a challenging month. Yes, we've continued to experience the high census and, um, you know, through, through January, through now, yes. Kimberly, do we have any announcements? I do have just a couple of things. I wanted to uh, let the board know about the employee of the month, uh, Danielle Weatherford. Um, she, as one of the two hospital cashiers, uh, Danielle believes the most important part of her job is easing the mind of our patients. Or as she puts it, patients should be able to focus on healing, not worrying about their bills. Um, she says, I try to help them find resolutions to ease their minds or direct them to someone who can address their needs. Um, Danielle joined the Washington Hospital family in 2005 as a patient accounting representative for the billing department. She learned about insurance billing, the appeals process, and how to deal with upset patients. After three years, Danielle accepted an opportunity to transition into the role of cashier. Her role requires her to understand revenue from both patient and non-patient uh, sources. She is responsible for posting all revenue to the appropriate accounts and working with the accounting department to confirm the cash is balanced. In 2013, with the EPIC rollout, Danielle took on the role of super user. She has demonstrated her leadership skills and ability to train others while keeping the cashier's office running smoothly. Her manager, Pat Mary, notes that Danielle is always willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So I just want to wish uh, Danielle Weatherford uh, congratulations on our January Employee of the Month. Uh, but then just a couple other quick uh, announcements. Um, I, d I do want to say that um, on in December, uh, Washington Hospital began a collaboration with Alameda, Alameda County for, for the month of December to offer mobile COVID-19 testing to residents of long-term care facilities and businesses and other congregate settings, and uh, we tested over 330 Alameda County residents uh, during that time to help out with that. Um, there's a number of uh, different presentations that um, Dr. Diane Martin and others have been involved in in terms of educating the community on, on COVID and the vac vaccination options, and so we've continued to do that. Um, I also want to mention that the foundation has raised, our, our charitable foundation has raised more than $879,000 in support of the COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund. And so I really want to uh, thank the community for their great support of, 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 of everyone. It's really helping uh, to support the initiatives that we've had to put in place. So I wanted to, to let uh, the board know and thank the community for their great support. So those are my announcements uh, this evening. Great. Th thank you, Kimberly. It's great to see that uh, community support. It goes a long way to help us. So we will now go into a closed session. However, before doing so, I want to let the public know that they have a right to know what reportable action, if any, was taken in the, by the board during the closed session. Normally, the board would make that announcement following the closed session. As we do not know how long the closed session will last, we do not want members of the public waiting indefinitely on the phone for the board's report. Therefore, we ask that you contact the district clerk tomorrow. She will be happy to respond to any inquiries about reportable board actions. Our minutes will continue to reflect any reportable actions taken. Thank you, and the board will now adjourn to a closed session.